Hello again, and welcome back to Construction Grammar and its application to English. Today we're moving on to Chapter 6 on Language Processing, and I'll actually have two videos uh, for this chapter. One on Language Comprehension, that's this one, and another one on Language Production. But before we go into that, let me briefly recapitulate the story of Construction Grammar so far. What has happened in the previous five videos? Well, in the broadest of terms, what I've outlined is construction grammar as a model of linguistic knowledge, a model of what speakers know when they know a language. And this model comes with certain assumptions, certain assumptions, certain ideas about how linguistic knowledge is organized in the minds of speakers. Perhaps the most fundamental of these assumptions is that linguistic knowledge is knowledge of constructions. When you know a language, you know tons of constructions, and describing this constructional knowledge should be enough to capture all of your linguistic competence. Now, that's a fairly radical claim, <clears throat> and it also raises the question, well, if all of linguistic knowledge is constructional, then what are these constructions? Okay, there are four meaning pairings, there are generalizations that speakers make, mapping a certain form, morphological, syntactic form, onto a certain semantic, pragmatic, discourse functional meaning. Right, uh, these generalizations are learned and stored, but they're not stored individually, they're organized in a network. And in video three on the Constructicon, I explained how exactly these constructions are interlinked. Okay, what we're going to worry about in this video and in the next one is what is the evidence for this? How do we know that these assumptions are really borne out by what happens in the minds of actual speakers? Okay, and the evidence that I've given you so far has been largely qualitative. Uh, so I've told you that, well, ordinary language contains many, many idiomatic expressions and they have non-compositional meanings. Think of, by and large, all of a sudden, uh, pets of one's own and uh, the X of the wire and so on and so forth. Lots and lots of non-compositional meanings going on and they are hard to explain with a model that has just a mental lexicon and a mental grammar that allows you to put words together in a compositional fashion. Okay, that's the first bit of evidence that sort of suggests that maybe we need a construction grammar. Second piece of evidence, coercion effects. Uh, constructions override the lexical meaning of elements such as kangaroo. Kangaroo by itself means a furry, friendly animal. And if I ask you, could I have some more kangaroo, please? Um, that interpretation is slightly altered towards a meat interpretation. I've never tried kangaroo. I, I don't even want to try kangaroo. Um, right. Third piece of evidence, uh, there are idiosyncratic constraints associated with morphological and syntactic patterns. So they're not quite as rule-governed as it would seem um, at first glance. For instance, the ditransitive construction has a semantic constraint that the recipient be animate. I brought the table, a glass of water doesn't work. I brought the patient, a glass of water, that works. Um, with the S genitive here, um, the possessed entity must not be pronominal. So John's it does not work. John's book works fine. Right. Um, now, if you're not already convinced that construction grammar is a great idea, then these pieces of evidence will leave you thinking, yeah, well, it's really all anecdotal. You know, you're coming up with example after example after example. And all of this seems to suggest that, yeah, there's something going on. Um, but really, it's not systematic. It's not systematic. It's like, um, you know, conversation among friends and you're trying to tell your friends you're uh, going to quit smoking because it's not healthy. And another of your friends says, well, you know, my uncle, he smoked three packs of cigarettes a day and he lived to be 92. He ran a marathon a month before he died. Well... It's a piece of evidence, but it's a single piece of evidence. It's not systematic. It doesn't allow you to generalize much about the effects of smoking. Um, so there are dangers in anecdotal evidence, and I need to tell you about these. Well, you cherry-pick data, you discard problematic cases, and whether or not something is typical, you can't really know when you look at individual cases. So ideally, what we would need for construction grammar is evidence that has been obtained under controlled laboratory conditions, and we would want our evidence to be such that construction grammar predicts a certain behavior in speakers 
and then we design a test around those predictions and see whether or not our predictions turn out to be correct. Yeah, That's the way uh, it should work. And luckily, there is quite a bit of work underway that proceeds along this li these lines, and that's the work that I want to tell you about in this video. So, um, as I said, in this video, we'll look at evidence from language comprehension, and there, specifically, I would like to consider three um, pieces of evidence. The first of these is that constructions explain how speakers understand novel denominal verbs. Um, what are denominal verbs? Well, they're elements like water and water a plant, pepper and pepper a steak, or Gutenberg in Gutenberg a thesis. And if you're puzzled by this third example, do a bit of googling and you'll find out. Okay, these are old denominal verbs. I made up a new novel uh, denominal verb, namely to coffee. And the question is, how do we understand to coffee, a novel denominal verb? And the constructional view has a prediction ready, namely that if the lexical meaning of a word is unclear, then the construction in which it is embedded should provide a meaning via the principle of coercion. Just to remind you, the principle of coercion, if a lexical item is semantically incompatible with its morphosyntactic context, then the meaning of that lexical item conforms is shaped by the meaning of the structure in which it is embedded. So we have a mass noun like beer embedded in the plural construction and the plural construction coerces the mass meaning of beer into a countable meaning. Works similarly in John sauce the pizza and Frank played the piano to pieces. I talked about these examples in earlier videos. Right, so here are a few examples of two coffee. Don't forget to coffee the scientists every two hours. Where should we coffee? I coffeed myself into a frenzy. A mainly Merlot blend that also contains Cabernet Sauvignon and Syrah, a glorious mouthful of black fruits leavened with spice and chocolate, silky and rich, with a coffeed finish. Makes you want to have a drink. Right, um, so you probably had a little difficulty figuring out what the verb coffee in these examples means. And notice that uh, in these sentences it means slightly different things. <clears throat> That's quite amazing. How did you do that? Um, there are two possible explanations. The first explanation is the constructional hypothesis that the morphosyntactic context determines how you interpret uh, a novel denominal verb like to coffee. So in I coffeed myself into a frenzy, you recognize, oh, okay, it's the resultative construction. To coffee here means uh, do something um, with coffee and that results in some other thing happening. You could also take a more pedestrian stand and say, well, there are lexical items in I coffeed myself into a frenzy and these lexical items are enough for me to infer what's going on that you could call the common sense hypothesis. So I coffeed myself into a frenzy. Well, what can happen when you bring coffee, uh, a flex of action and a frenzy together? Not so difficult to figure out. You don't need constructions to figure out what's going on. Okay, how can you decide whether the constructional hypothesis is right or the common sense hypothesis is right? One strategy you can adopt is to keep the lexical context the same while varying the construction. So there, the lexical uh, common sense hypothesis would say, well, speakers have nothing to go on. The interpretation should be the same. Whereas in the constructional hypothesis, uh, there should be differences. Okay, here's a study done by uh, Kashak and Glenberg in 2000, um, and they had people do an inference task where subjects saw two stimuli sentences and then uh, a test sentence afterwards, and they had to match the test sentence with one of the two stimuli sentences and had to answer the question, okay, which of the stimuli sentences uh, allows you to infer that the test sentence happened? To make this a little more concrete, here are two stimuli sentences. So people saw a slide like this. Lynn crutched Tom the apple so he wouldn't starve. You notice it's a ditransitive construction. And Lynn crutched the apple so Tom wouldn't starve. Uh, uh, transitive construction with a purpose clause. And notice that the lexical items are exactly the same. Yeah, as no lexical difference between the two. Just the construction that's different. Then people saw a test sentence, like Lynn acted on the apple, 
And when you're being asked, okay, Lynn acted on the apple, think about this, um, which of the two stimulus sentences allows you to infer that Lynn acted on the apple? Well, you're really likely to uh, pick the transitive here. Lynn crutched the apple so Tom wouldn't starve. That is consistent with Lynn acted on the apple. Conversely, if you're being uh, given the test sentence, Tom got the apple, then in all likelihood you will choose the ditransitive and say, well, Tom got the apple. That is consistent with uh, Lynn crutched Tom the apple so he wouldn't starve. So you're assigning different meanings, as it were, to this novel denominal verb crutch. Here are the results and in these bars you see the percentage of ditransitive uh, stimuli sentences chosen. So, um, well, you see the big bars, those um, results mean that if people were given the test sentence Tom got the apple, they were very very likely to choose the ditransitive. And um, there were two conditions actually one condition with conventional ditransitive verbs like throw, Lynn threw Tom the apple, and uh, then these novel denominal verbs, uh, Tom, Lynn crutched Tom the apple. And you see that there's a slight difference, yeah? So with crutch, mm, the ditransitive is not quite as prominent, but it's really very prominent. And if you look at the arrow bars, there's probably not even a significant difference between the two. And um, the small bars here, those are the Lynn acted on the apple. If, people are asked to uh, select a sentence that's consistent with Lynn acted on the apple, very few um, chose the ditransitive. Right, so this uh, looks a lot like the syntactic context influences the way you interpret a novel uh, denominal verb like crutch. Glenberg and Kashak um, asked a follow-up question, namely, do speakers only do this when they are being pushed with nose into a ditransitive construction, or do they do this spontaneously? Um, do they spontaneously associate verb meaning and constructional meaning? And for this, they slightly altered the experimental design. They gave people a story that ended with a test sentence. Uh, so let me read the story to you. Tom and Lynn competed on different baseball teams. After the game, Tom was teasing Lynn about striking out three times. Lynn said, oh, I was just distracted by your ugly face. I can hit anything to any field using anything. And to prove it, she took an apple that she had brought as a snack and a crutch that belonged to the baseball club's infirmary. And now the first group heard as the final sentence, um, Lynn crutched Tom her apple to prove her point, ditransitive. The second group heard, Lynn crutched her apple to prove her point to Tom. So again, same lexical material, different constructions. And after that, the task that people had was they were asked to define the verb crutch. So, and what uh, Kashak and Glenberg looked out for was whether or not these definitions of crutch included the notion of transfer. And the hypothesis was, well, if people saw the ditransitive as the final clause, they were more likely to think that crutch is something about transfers than when uh, they just saw the transitive construction. What happened? Well, with the ditransitive stimulus, we see that, okay, there's a higher percentage of definitions including this notion of transfer with the transitive stimulus a lower ratio but even with the transitive it's only at 50 percent and um, if you look at the arrow bars there it's probably not a huge difference between the two statistically speaking nonetheless the tendency goes in the right direction yeah that's uh, if you give people a ditransitive stimulus they're more likely to think that crutch has to do with transfer. So the constructional hypothesis uh, explains the speaker behavior to some extent. Syntactic form guides the interpretation of newly coined words, but notice that this doesn't rule out the common sense hypothesis. It doesn't prove it wrong. Uh, in all likelihood, the lexical context does influence the interpretation of new words. But it stands to reason that constructional context influences how people uh, interpret newly coined words. Moving on to the second point, um, second piece of evidence for construction grammar from language comprehension. Constructional meanings are routinely accessed in sentence comprehension. And in order to discuss this, we need to take a step back and ask, well, how do listeners understand the meaning of a simple sentence such as John eats a cookie? There are lots and lots of 
well-established psycholinguistic theories out there, how people parse sentences, how people construct uh, sentence meaning. And uh, all of them virtually agree that, okay, it's, it happens incrementally. You parse one word, and then you hear a second word. You look that up. You um, integrate with the first one. You make projections about what might happen next, and so on and so forth. And construction grammar is largely in agreement with that. Um, but um, the traditional answer puts special emphasis on the verb. I mean, here is access the lexical meaning of the verb, and then map nominal structures onto the event structure of that verb. I explained a bit about this in the second video on argument structure constructions. Right. Um, that is something you could call the verb-centered view. The verb is the main determinant of sentence meaning and also structurally. It's relational, it projects a number of arguments, it um, pulls the sentence together, if you like. Plus, there's also psycholinguistic evidence that when subjects are asked to sort sentences into categories, um, they sort more often after the same verb than after the same subject. If you give people a stash of uh, cards with sentences on them, uh, and the sentences have different verbs um, and different subjects, yeah, it doesn't matter whether the subject is John or an elephant or the Bank of Scotland or anything like that, if the verb is the same, then people will show a tendency to group those sentences together. So, some good evidence for the verb center view. But the constructional, uh, well, there are some problems uh, associated with the verb center view, and some of these I discussed in earlier videos. First, verbs have not just one argument structure pattern, they have several argument structure patterns. So, kick we usually think of as a transitive verb, pad kicked the ball, um, but uh, we also see it in other constructions, pad kicked at the ball, pad kicked the ball out of the stadium, um, pad kicked and kicked, pad kicked his way into the Premier League, and so on and so forth. Right. Um, along with this goes uh, the observation that different argument structure patterns impose different semantic constraints on the verb. So the verb bring um, occurs with a goal that can be inanimate in the prepositional dative construction. I brought a glass of water to the table. But um, these inanimate goals are not acceptable in the ditransitive construction. I brought the table, a glass of water is ungrammatical. A solution for this, uh, if you're assuming the verb center view, is to say, well, th there's really two brings in English. Uh, one that takes an inanimate goal and one that takes an animate recipient. And that, of course, solves the problem, but it also creates a follow-up problem, namely implausible verb senses in uh, examples like uh, John baked Mary a cake or Fred C. sneezed the napkin off the table. Yeah, there you would have to come up with these implausible verb senses like moving by means of exhaling in the burst from the nose and so on and so forth. Yeah. Um, so the constructional view comes in as a complement to the verb-centered view. And on the constructional view, understanding a sentence involves processing verb meaning and also constructional meaning. Constructional meaning, I talked about this in the video on argument structure constructions. The ditransitive, for instance, carries the meaning of a transfer. The caused motion construction evokes the idea that X causes Y to move to Z. And during sentence comprehension, then, uh, verb meaning and constructional meaning are fused, and there is something called the principle of semantic coherence. Let me briefly remind you of that. There are restrictions on the possible combinations of verbs and constructions, because verbs project roles in their event structure, and constructions project roles in their event structure, and they have to match. They have to be fusible, and they are fusible or compatible if one can be understood as an instance of another. Um, yeah. Um, so a thrower in John uh, threw the ball, and uh, an, an agent in uh, the transitive construction, um, John threw the ball to Mar uh, John threw Mary the ball. Sorry. Um, those two are fusible. In some other combinations, uh, this does not work so well. So the verb here asks for uh, an experiencer, um, and the 
resultative construction asks for an agent, and these two cannot be understood in terms of each other. So John heard his ears death with heavy metal is out. Right, um, so the crucial question now, do listeners behave according to the verb-centered view or according to the constructional view? And in order to test this, uh, Bencini and Goldberg designed an experiment where they gave people uh, sentences to sort. And here are the stimuli that they used. And you see that they did something clever. They crossed four different verbs, throw, get, slice, and take, with four different constructions, the, the transitive, the ditransitive, the cause motion, the resultative, giving people two very strong cues that you, they could use in uh, sorting these stimuli. They could sort after the verb. And in fact, the verb centrage would, would strongly predict that people sort after the verb. And then these constructions. And as a construction grammarian, you might be more inclined to think, well, they probably sorted after the constructions. Yeah. So how did people sort? It turns out that uh, half of the population sorted um, constructionally. So we have out of a population of 20, 10 perfect constructional sorting, zero perfect verbal sortings. So that is surprising to some extent. And then 10, ten mixed sortings. You know, the more creative minds among us have produced mixed sortings that think outside the box. Um, and it turns out that these were closer to constructional sortings than to verbal sortings. You can figure this out if you take a sorting and figure out how many steps do you need to arrive at a perfect constructional sorting, how many steps do you need to arrive at a perfect verbal sorting. Well, they were closer to the constructional end of the continuum. Right. If you're confronted with this uh, and you're harboring the verb-centered view, you could say, well, maybe people sorted after constructions when the verb was really unspecific, like with get and take. Get, that's not very specific semantically. Take, are heavily polysemous and general, and, and so that's why they sort in this way. However, notice that they're not just get and take here, but also throw and slice, which are much more specific. And it turns out that there is no difference between the, the sortings done with get and take and the sortings done with throw and slice. So this objection um, does not hold water. Right, so the result is that constructional meaning is spontaneously used as a sorting criterion and listeners routinely access constructional meaning during sentence comprehension. That's another nice little piece of evidence for construction grammar. So, the third and final piece of evidence for today is that constructions explain knowledge of grammatical unacceptability, and that's a biggie. That's a big issue. How do speakers learn not to say certain things, like the magician vanished the woman, or she explained him the news, or she considered to go to the store? As a proficient speaker of English, you know that, no, that doesn't work. But how do you arrive at that knowledge? That's the question. And constructions come in as, a, uh, as an explanation here. Well, if you want to, you can pause this video here and come up with one or two possible explanations of how speakers learn not to say things. And um, once you come back to this video, I will explain um, a number of hypotheses surrounding this problem. Ready? All right, I'm going to continue. A first hypothesis would be that children say these things, but then their parents come and correct them. Yeah. Um, in real life, this doesn't happen. Direct negative evidence is very, very sparse. And um, so adults rarely correct child speech and learn. No, look, it's not like that. Uh, you can't say, John explained me the theory. It has to be, John explained the theory to me. You should know that you're two and a half. Um, no, that doesn't happen, let me tell you. Um, so there are sometimes these recast child utterances. So. Um, the child said, John, explain me the theory. I said, oh, John, explain the theory to you. Ah, oh, interesting. Yeah, but also that, uh, it's questionable whether that really drives uh, the learning process. Another hypothesis um, would be that children don't hear these sentences during acquisition, and hence they find them unacceptable later. You know, if you don't feed your kids celery and carrots and eggplant and whatnot. As adults, they will say, ooh, eggplant, I don't like eggplant. Yeah, that's a possibility. But does it 
work with language? Well, there are many creative uses in language that children did not hear, and yet they find them acceptable. Sentences like, the python cuffed her back out, or the dinosaur swam his friends to the mainland. When you hear that, you're not going, ah, oh, that's ungrammatical. You're going, oh, well, that's creative. That's stretching the limits of language a little bit, but it's okay. It's okay. So, the third hypothesis that I want to elaborate on in this video is uh, called statistical preemption. And it works like this. A hearer hears formulation B in a context where she or he would have expected a semantically related formulation A that is also simpler. So the kernel of the idea is that, oh gosh, people are doing something complex when they could have been doing something very simple. They must have had a reason for that. Yeah, that's the idea. So imagine two people arguing. Person A says, will you give me the CD? That transitive. And then person B says, why should I give it to you? So they're using the prepositional dative although they've just been primed with the ditransitive, with a verb that strongly takes the ditransitive give. Yeah? So person A thinks, well, why are you not saying give you it? That would be much simpler. Well, there must be a reason. If you experience this over and over again, you might arrive at the idea that, well, there's perhaps a grammatical constraint that bars the sequence give you it. And indeed, that's the case. Uh, another case, if you observe people say, the magician made the woman disappear over and over again, and disappear is a frequent verb, um, you might eventually think, well, okay, they always go for this complex make causative thing and they never say the magician disappeared the woman. It must be that there's a grammatical constraint that says the magician disappeared the woman does not work. Right, statistical preemption, and you notice that there's the word statistical, it has to do something with frequency. So uh, this ties in with usage-based models of linguistic knowledge. Listeners register copious amounts of frequencies in their minds. You know, they take frequency, they take stats on how often they hear syntactic instructions, they take stats on how often they have certain lexical elements, and on top of that they take stats on how often they hear lexical elements within syntactic constructions. Where you do a lot of stuff. Um, so if a frequent verb does not appear in a frequent construction, like explain is a frequent verb, the ditransitive is a frequent construction, but the two never occur together, and that gets speakers to infer that there is a grammatical constraint barring the co-occurrence of explain and the ditransitive. Statistical preemption. Nice idea. But is there evidence for it? And uh, that's what we're getting to now. So let's do a little experiment. Uh, get pen and paper ready, please. You can pause the video if you need a second. And uh, I'll make this large. So uh, here you see two cows. And you see the cows are labeled. There is an active cow and there is a sleepy cow. And uh, now write down what happens. Yeah. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, what you have written is probably that the active cow moved to the star. Mm -hmm. So, if you've done that, great, great, you know, keep up the good work. Uh, there are more pictures coming. Just keep writing down what happens. Okay, we have that. Oh, that's a lizard. I mean, if you're uh, if you're an expert on these matters, you know you can write. Oh, it's it's a comet of Iran. Uh, but for all purposes, it's a lizard. All right, you have four sentences now uh, with animals moving to the star. And, uh, well, what did you write for this last sentence here? Um, probably something like, the kitten that's awake moved to the star. Because awake, you can't say the awake kitten. Yeah, that's a special adjective in English. 
uh, an A adjective. And A adjectives are funny because they're restricted to predicative usage. You can't say an afraid child, an afloat ship, an alive monster in a blaze building, and so on and so forth. Um, morphologically, these guys are parsable more often than not. So you, uh, a float parses into a, and then the verb stem float. Notice that acute is a little different. So acute is not an A adjective, strictly speaking. And um, what's puzzling is that semantics and orphanology don't explain the restriction on these usage patterns. So um, you can say the scared child. Why not the afraid child? It means the same thing. You can say the acute problem. Acute has the same um, pronunciation. What well, does the same pros prosody, the same um, <clears throat> makeup, phonological makeup, as uh, afloat and afraid? So why is that? How do speakers learn that A adjectives are not used attributively? So that's a case study question that illustrates how speakers learn not to say things. All right, uh, you notice that in these stimuli here, we have A adjectives like asleep and non-A adjectives, vigilant. And uh, we also have made up words, yeah? So zeggy. That looks like an adjective, but it's not. It's a made-up word. Adax. Now that is also a made-up word, but it looks a bit like an A adjective. So the question is, do you count it amongst the likes of um, asleep, awake, afraid, and so on and so forth? Or do you say, well, it's you know, just a made-up word. We can say the Adax lizard. That's the question that uh, Jeremy Boyd and Adele Goldberg tried to figure out in this paper. And so they had stimuli of the kind that you see here. Um, different kinds of stimuli. You see there are two factors uh, crossed here. So novelty is one factor, familiar adjectives and novel adjectives. And familiar adjectives like vigilant and sleepy and also familiar A adjectives like asleep. And then novel adjectives, chammy and zoopy and also novel A adjectives, adax. Yeah. Right. Do people um, treat these kinds of adjectives differently when they write down, you know, the chammy chipmunk moved to the star or the lizard that's a dax moved to the star? Okay, in order to prime people for both possible variants, uh, <clears throat> Boyd and Goldberg had these stimuli that you see on the right here. So um, here are two owls and one smokes, one gambles. And here you would have to use the owl that smokes moves to the star. And here are two raccoons with high frequency adjectives, slow and fast. And there you would be strongly inclined to use the attributive version. The fast raccoon moves to the star. Right. OK. Um, so, in the experiments, um, Boyd and Goldberg uh, expose people to animals moving to stars. And uh, the experiment, well, they did three variants of the experiments, and all of them had a training block and a production block. And the production block was identical across the three experiments. It was like the stuff that you saw on the screen a couple of minutes ago. But the training block was varied. In the first experiment, there was no exposure to novel A adjectives, such as a dax and a blim. Yeah? There were exposures to ordinary adjectives and uh, familiar A adjectives, but no mention was made of novel A adjectives. <clears throat> Leaving it open whether or not people would treat a dax and a blim as A adjectives or not. In the second experiment, there was an example with a novel A adjective that was used in a relative clause structure. So the experimenter said, oh, look, there's two foxes. Oh, the fox that was a blim moved to the star. So people had an idea that, okay, a blim is used in a relative clause, meaning that probably all A new A adjectives that I'm going to see here are going to pattern like ordinary A adjectives, namely with a relative clause, not in attributive constructions. And then in the third experiment, the training condition was, again, slightly altered, namely 
there also was a presentation of a novel A adjective, but it was in a so-called pseudo-preemptive context. Uh, listen to this. The fox that was a blim and proud of himself moved to the star. Here you can't really tell whether a blim behaves like an A adjective because the proud of himself part forces the relative clause. You can't say the proud of himself fox. So here speakers could think that, okay, well, okay, the proud of himself probably accounts for the fact that the experiment used the relative clause here, and a blim just works like any old adjective that I know. Okay, let's look at the results a bit. Um, here are the results from the first experiment, and you see nice patterns uh, in the bars there. There's a main effect of adjective type, so non-A adjectives are used with an att attributive uh, construction much, much more often. Yeah, that's good news. And uh, there's also a main effect of familiarity. So familiar uh, adjectives are less often used attributively overall. Now this, of course, is mainly due to an interaction of adjective type and familiarity. You see, if you look at the light gray bars, the A adjectives, you see that in the familiar condition, people were not very likely to use an attributive construction. So the awake kitten, some people said that, but most people said the kitten that's awake. Um, that's different in the novel condition. Yeah. So the adax lizard, people were not so uptight about saying the adax lizard because, well, it's a, not a familiar A adjective. All right. Um, do I have a discussion page? Yes. So subject preferred relative clauses for both familiar and unfamiliar A adjectives, which shows that, okay, there maybe is a budding generalization there, but um, there's a difference in degree. Um, so unfamiliar A adjectives, there the constraint is not as restrictive. Question is, does this change if subjects are given an explicit cue to the group membership of a dax and a blim? Yeah, if we say, oh, there's the fox that's a blim uh, and it moves to the star. Yeah. So here in the second experiment, the training block contained a sentence of that kind with the experimenter saying, the fox that's a blim went to the star. <laughs> it's kind of hippie, really. Um, okay, let's look at the results. Um, you see, it, there's a difference. If you look at the light gray bars, um, the difference that was there in experiment one has almost disappeared. Yeah. Um, so again, there's a main effect of adjective type, the non-A adjectives pattern, very different from the A adjectives, but the interaction of adjective type and familiarity is gone. It's the same result across familiar and novel A adjectives. So, hearing a sentence like the fox that's a blim went to the star triggered the uh, inference that, okay, okay, A adjectives, I get it, I get it. Right. Uh, so, if speakers suspect that a certain context is avoided, then they pick up on that and use the preemptive context, the fox that's a blim moved to the star. So, the reasoning is, why the heck is the experimenter using the relative clause, which is less typical? Ah, okay, it's probably because the usual way is not working because it's an A adjective. I get it. Right, so when subjects then hear a novel A adjective, um, they, they, they use the relative clause pattern. Third experiment. What counts as a preemptive context? Here in the third experiment, the training block also contained an unfamiliar A adjective, uh, but the context was pseudo preemptive, that is, it was uninformative with regard to the constraints, the possible constraints. If I say the fox that's a blim and proud of himself went to the star, you have no way of knowing how a blim uh, behaves, yeah, because uh, you can't use proud of himself as uh, attributive, and you can't combine this with a normal attributive adjective. The brown and proud of himself fox does not work, um, but not because brown wouldn't be able to appear in attributive contexts. So if you look at the results from experiment three, you see that, okay, this time around, um, familiar and unfamiliar A adjectives pattern very differently because the unfamiliar A adjectives pattern along with all of the other ordinary 
adjectives, meaning that speakers are very rational about preemptive context. Is if there is another explanation, okay, and proud of himself, they will discount that an item appeared in a preemptive context, and this is evidence for rather subtle, rather sophisticated statistical bookkeeping in language users. Yeah, fun story. I, I really like it. Um, summarizing today's session here, um, I outlined three pieces of evidence for construction grammar from studies that focused on language comprehension. First, constructions explain how speakers understand newly coined words, namely via the principle of coercion. Second, uh, construction explain why speakers categorize different sentences into the same group, namely because they're influenced by similarities in constructional meaning, not necessarily lexical material. And third, constructions explain knowledge of grammatical unacceptability, namely via the principle of statistical preemption. If someone does something that's complex when they could have done something simple, there must be some reason for that. All right. Um, in the next video, I'll continue uh, to talk about this topic, psycholinguistic evidence, but we'll move on from language production, no, from, from language comprehension to language production, because there's also interesting stuff going on there. All right. Um, I hope to, well, I hope you watch the next video as well.